So we would invite Justice Suresh. Justice Suresh has also been there in the Bombay High Court. He retired from the Bombay High Court. But he has lots of experience, lots of information, because he's very closely associated with the law. He was a law professor. He was a judge in the City Civil Court and the Sessions Court. So he's, he even practiced before the Bombay High Court. So he's got just lots of experience. And most interesting for us and Justice Suresh is that after retirement, he has been a part of several people's commissions, several people's tribunals to create public opinion, to tell people what actually has happened. Because very often the government whitewashes something we don't know. Even the newspapers don't tell us what the correct picture is. And these people's tribunals and these people's commission tell us what actually happened. And he's been a part of a large number of them, the Bombay communal riots, the riots, communal riots in Ahmedabad, even with regards to forced demolitions where Jaggi Bastis are, are being demolished. So we really welcome Justice Suresh to share his views. Friends, some time ago, I was asking myself, do you think we will ever abolish death sentence at all. If at all we were to abolish death sentence, who would do it? Would the government would ever do it? Or is there any hope the court could do it? I thought someday our judges have regard to our constitution, have regard to the fact they gave wider meaning to Article 21, bring in due process, what is fair and justice, justice and so on. I thought there would be some day our court would say, okay, time you put an end to the sentence. Uh, state of courts, I never had any hope. And even today, I have no hope that the state would, I think there's something wrong with this. Even today, uh, I don't think the court, uh, the, the state would ever abolish the sentence. Not with the way the people are talking about, going about, and still think. Uh, that this kind of death sentence should be. That's that's the one. But I want to tell you something uh, about myself. I remember sometime in I became a judge in the Bombay High Court, sometime in '86, sometime in '87. There was a meeting in the city of Bombay, organized by the Amnesty International. Those days, Amnesty International was taboo for the judges, particularly, and for many others. They could oh, don't no, no, don't go to Amnesty International. But there was a meeting in the city of Bombay on the abolition of death sentence. And I presented over that meeting as a judge. And in my speech I said, I have the power to give death sentence, but I'm not qualified to give death sentence. How am I qualified to give death sentence to anyone? Because I don't know the man, I know only the crime. If I know the crime, would that okay, I can punish him. But can I say whether I can take away his life? What what is he? I don't know. So this is what I said. Of course, when I came back to the court the next day, it came in the Times of India, the front page, this is what the judge says and so on. And many other colleagues were shocked that I could make such a statement that I would not give that sentence. I will tell you as again, uh, I had one occasion uh, where Bhatshan Singh was cited before me. Uh, that was where in, at Nagpur myself and Jesse Botha was similar to me, we were sitting together. And that was a case where what happened was, uh, a Muslim gentleman, he suspected his wife was not true to him. Something, he had that feeling. And one day he wanted to kill his wife and took an axe and tried to cut her. And what happened was the little child came in between and the child died. So he was given life sentence. He was an excellent uh, prisoner inside, well mannered, well behaved, everything, no complaint whatsoever. He got earned the remission. After about 12 years, he came out. He went back to his home and again, when he went home, his wife was there, his son, his one son had grown up, married, and quite a happy family at that time. And he was there for about two months, everything was okay. And one night, he took an ax, his wife was sleeping next to him, took an ax and cut up straight away. Because he had all that obsession in his mind, that wife was never true to me, and I was not allowed to. So she was given, of course, the class session called the death sentence. It came for confirmation before us. And uh, 
in the in the in the Nag Nag province. I told I still remember that our Shivpur Karun because that's the Supreme Court retired now. He was a prosecutor and he cited Bhajan Singh. What does Bhajan Singh say? You commit murder once and you commit some murder second time. Okay, you must be hanged. There are no other go. I said sorry. I said this man, he had one obsession. In fact, he was clear that obsession. He could not have been a criminal at all. And therefore, we, we didn't give that sentence. Unfortunately, because the state didn't go further to the Supreme Court. And I'm saying this because, you see, if you see the law, 90, after 1955, death sentence was a rule on the criminal procedure court. Life sentence was an exception. <laughs> so what judges, what we were doing at that time, as judges, okay, uh, uh, death sentence was a rule. We always felt, okay, Possibly, you can save this man, not necessarily give that sentence. What do we do? The rule is I must give that sentence. So I must have special reasons to why I can't give that sentence. So there, we used to study the man. Study in the sense, in the meager sense, of course. We had no scientific approach or anything of the kind. But we would tell, take into account his family background, his wife, his children, his other things. Well, it's the first time he's coming to the offense. So when we, not only cry, of course, here, but you look at the man. 1973, the law was changed. The law was, so 1973 onwards, now life sentence is a rule, death sentence is an exception. And therefore, death sentence should have special reasons. Now what do we do today? We, of course, we, we do life sentence, but we want to give death sentence to such a man. What do we do? We multiply or what you call uh, ex again explore uh, explore the crime that is committed. That's what Bhajan Singh said. If man is killed with one stab bullet, okay, it's an ordinary case. If the man is killed with ten stab bullets, okay, this is a rare so that case. This is a kind of thing. Where did we study the man? Man we have never studied. But again, uh, this is a kind of kind of approach. So when rare so rare cases came, I tell I tell you, Jesse Bhagavati was the one who said, uh, okay, this is ultra about the constitution and so on. But you see carefully, uh, I had to look at it. Uh, if those majority judges gave the judgment, Justice Bhagavati had dissented but not given the judgment. I wish he had practically not drafted the judgment. I do not know. I wish I thought I could ask, ask Bhagavati, but I could not get a chance. Because you see the law reports, if you see the law reports, Justice Bhagavati gave his dissenting judgment after a long time, after more than a year, two he years. gave it. After two years. Two years he gave the judgment. See, this is where, again, one more question comes. Whenever we talk of Supreme Court, what is the Supreme Court? Two judges? After 31 judges, two judges in Supreme Court? Every now and then, two judges decide one way, two judges decide the other way. How do you call it Supreme Court? South African court struck down the provisional to death sentence when all the judges sat together and decided. The Supreme Court in the real opinion of the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, <coughs> in all my eyes, I, very often I quote, for example, the development of Bombay, the mill area. The two ex-judges of the Bombay High Court gave an excellent judgment upholding the amendment in the town plan the rules, which gave two-thirds of the land to the corporation and to the public and one third to private builders. And this judgment was reversed by two erstwhile judges of the High Court, but sitting in the Supreme Court, in the name of the Supreme Court, reversed it in three months. And today we have Shanghai in the middle that go and see that. This is exactly how the judgment comes. So the question is again, this again comes here. How do they decide? Of course, I don't want to elaborately go here, rightly explain the whole thing. But when we talk of uh, talk of uh, rarest of rare cases. Uh, I, according to me, you see, after Guru's case, they had one more collective conscience. What do you mean, how do you determine the collective conscience of the people? And when they came, they said to the Abdul Guru, Justice Shah rightly said, it was a flawed trial, flawed trial. He had never had proper assistance. Things have come on record. But the Supreme Court judge said, we looked into the whole record, and what did the Supreme Court say? The judge or the trial judge did his best. What do you mean judge did his best? But what is important is not that did his best. The question, did he get enough, enough support in his defense? Did he, was he, could he get a proper defense? That was not the question. The Supreme 
report that they say the trial judge did his best. And on that basis, he said there's no merit in this, in this contention. And that is how, actually, after Guru's case, you see, the, I'll say two lines. When the case uh, came, uh, after Guru, of course, I mean, he was brought, that's a, I mean, that people may agree. I know, you have read the Arundhati Roy's book, 13th December. You get all the details of that. Of course, recently, the Hindu paper, yesterday or day yesterday, there was a criticism on Arundhati Roy's statement. So I don't want to go into that. But there are three, one other important element. Along with Astral Guru, they arrested one Professor Gilani, a professor from Delhi University, well highly respected uh, Professor Gilani. And, and then, of course, one Shaukat Ali was there. What the government did at that time was the leader of the whole group was Professor Gilani. That was the way he came. In the matter, all three were given a sentence. Matter came to the High Court, when the High Court, Gilani was clean acquitted. There's no case, Gramjat one appeared for Gilani. It was established there's nothing against Gilani. So Gilani could never could have done, he was not there at all. In fact, whole thing was bogus and he got acquitted. When the matter went to the Supreme Court, the Shaukat Ali was ultimately convicted on a lesser sentence, about 10 years or some such thing, he was held out. So when the matter went on to the Supreme Court, after this, the, the people who connected with this kind of thing, they started saying the leader of this was, uh, was uh, Abdul Guru. Abdul Guru was not a leader at all, at no time he was treated as a leader. But they were, of course, all represented Abdul Guru, dreaded terrorist, dreaded terrorist, this kind of thing. That's, that, that's how it went on. Uh, even in Bhajan Singh, there's one, one thing which you must understand. That is, Bhajan Singh is not only describing the crime. Crime, of course, the two dull sheets, everything you have to do. But that one sentence in the Bhajan case is a very important sentence, which I will refer to the I saw thereafter. What he says is, see, there what the Supreme Court is real and abiding, I tell you, read the sentence. Uh, yeah. A real and abiding concern the dignity of life, but postulate resistance to taking a life through laws instrumentality. This is what I'm saying itself. That ought not to be done except in the rarest of rare cases when this is the most important alternative option is unquestionably foreclosed. What is that alternative option? But I'm saying it's such a unless the alternative option is, is unquestionably foreclosed. And that is exactly what is required. Even prosecution thinks the man should get a death sentence, they must show not only establish a committed crime, they must also show that he cannot be reformed in any manner. He cannot be, no other option is possible except to take away his life. Which prosecutor would do it? Who could do that? Okay, if that's evidence, okay. Then the last thing, man cannot be reformed. Okay, we can take his take of his life. But that, so this is a test. You must have recently, there was a case uh, after the Dilbay Ayyavin, what, what came, the case that, that was, uh, that came to report Justice Swatandra Kumar and other. That's the case where in Pune, uh, a 23 year old man raped and murdered a young girl and uh, death sentence was given in the Pune court. The matter came to the High Court. I could also give death sentence here, confirmed death sentence. And the matter came to the Supreme Court. When so recently, this was only a few, sometime in December this was decided. And when the matter came to the Supreme Court, the lawyer appearing for the accused plainly said, I'm not arguing on the merits of the case, I'm only arguing on the question of death sentence. And what he said was, of course, that he is played, played before the court certain circumstances. One of the circumstances, the paper highlighted, newspaper highlighted, which of course was the wrong approach, that was that he, the accused, was drunk at that time. Now, that could never be a circumstance to, to say it's a rare to rare case. The judge didn't say that. They took into account all facts, but they emphasized that the prosecution let no evidence to show that the accused cannot be reformed. It is on that basis they said, they said, okay, 
we will convert that behavior to life sentence. Of course, the media, I still remember, I was a part of the television, NDTV program. I wanted to explain this, the media would not allow. And, and uh, argument was, if this would give a wrong message, what the media would give, give a wrong message. So today, this is kind of thinking, wrong message. And that's how the, the latest judgment will build other people. Collective culture. As we are going to collect the conscience, will of the people, okay, for parliament, will of the people, okay. Collect the conscience of the parliament is okay. But the judges have to go by the will of the people. How do they, so ultimately come to, not the will of the people, not the collect the conscience of people, your own subjective perception. This is the problem with the judges today. And that is how today, uh, I'm not sure whether, uh, in fact, you ask me, the guidelines, or whatever the guidelines, they have purported to mention from time to time under having rare or rare cases, if properly analyzed, are all violative of Article 14. Because each judge can say that he can do this, he can do this, his own guidelines. So it's violative of Article 14 and cannot be allowed to do this, this kind of thing. Actually, in the latest, uh, as the, I'm told that after Varma's report, uh, the law, they have brought the law. And if I'm right, in the law, the government has tried to retain that there should be death sentence in rarest of rare cases in the case of rape and murder. I, I'm really shocked to see that. Can the government say, or probably a law, say, this is a rare of rare case? I think that is something I can't imagine. And if the government wants to say, these are rare of rare cases, which only means judges will have no option. And that is again violative of, uh, of the early, early, because there are yeah, cases where the, one, one of the things is if you are uh, convicted for death and you are uh, having a life sentence of inside the jail and you commit a murder, we have provided under the, under the IPC, which has been shut down, which says in such a case, you, that man shall be given death sentence. The court said no. We can still be the same option. Right or death, the court has to decide. You can't prescribe that there shall be no other punishment except the death penalty. So here also when the government itself wants to come with a criteria of rare or rare cases, I think that, that cannot stand scrutiny. Okay. I only want to say one small thing at the end. Just see, Abdul Guru has been inside the prison for the last 10 years. What did the government do about him? Could they not say, okay, you are not taking his life. He need not just preserve it then. Could they not have found out how did the man behave? How did he, how, could he have been improved or not? It's a better obligation. Government must consider. Man is inside. Should he be treated as a, as, a, as a prisoner forever in the same condition? Or could he not have found out his background, his life, his whether he can be changed or not? Many things can be done. We could have, we could have tried to, they could have done. Nothing of the kind of now, nothing else can even thought of as to what we should do. For example, Rajiv Gandhi killers, I met one of them, I went to I went to Tamil Nadu, met one of them, Karari was a boy who was just about 18 or 19 years, convicted is a very slender evidence. The only he, he supposed a bottle of battery, a small battery, which was fixed in Dharu's belt, and that is why he was given death sentence. I can tell you also one more thing. Much later we had some some uh, some kind of workshop in Delhi and uh, Justice Katie Thomas was one of the judges who was a party to the judgment and today of course Justice, I got his latest statement where he is, Justice Thomas says and I, I must tell you that what he says is, uh, I think I got it here, what he says is execution, yes, death penalty, this is what Katie Thomas says now, I wish he had said that, death penalty is nothing but brutal murder by state. This is what Justice Katie Thomas said. And I remember in a conference where we were all there, Justice Thomas said, if we had not given death sentence to three or four of them in Rajiv Gandhi murder case, people would have laughed at us. People would have laughed at us because we were not given death sentence. This is a kind of thinking. Because they still think in terms of will of the people, collective conscience. This kind of thing is oppressive. And this is a kind of thing. And therefore when when Abdul Guru was inside. One other thing which comes to my mind is, Abdul Guru was inside. Did he, did he not apply for mercy or not? When did he apply? How many times did he apply? What did he do for all these 10 years with his mercy petition? What's the information we have? 
Okay, so much petition was rejected on 3rd of, of Feb. But was that the only petition? Was there no other petition? How did the Home Minister earlier deal with that? We have got a chaos in case, which says, the, which says uh, the advice given by the, by the cabinet to the president in the matter of execution can't be questioned, can't be questioned. It is only, the president can only act on the advice of the cabinet. Okay, what did the cabinet do all the 10 years? How did they deal with that? How do you get this information? I think people like Chaudhary or somebody would say, under right information. Of course, we had, in the past we would not allow. The court said, no, you are no, you're not entitled to it. But I think now we can demand that. And I also, Justice Kapadia, our former Chief Justice, of course not as a Chief Justice, until earlier, in one of his judgments he said, it is time we consider. That was, he said, in the context of your right of Dhanaji uh, Chatterjee, or I can't remember exactly, but he, he said that that is time we consider because what is required transparency in what they do and this time we consider that uh, we should lay down guidelines in the matter of application of mercy and so on. People talk oh law has followed the course but the law has not ended mercy petition is still a law and what how do you deal with that what is the evidence before us nothing 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 and uh, this is a kind of thing that is going on in this country and uh, well, I feel, uh, I don't know, I think uh, uh, we, of course, we have taken part in number, part of that campaign, number of meetings we had, number, so one thing I must tell you with that I conclude. I happened to come across a judgment of the Supreme Court which says, see, Article 21, we have redefined. Article 21, we have made something due process, law is fair and justice. And, and fair, just and reasonable. Procedure is fair, just and reasonable. And to what extent Article 21 survives? And there is judgment to the Supreme Court which says Article 21 survives till the last breath is taken. Till the last breath is, is when till the last breath is taken. That is when the man is hanged at the, at, at the, at the, at the place where he's executed. Till the last breath. What is the method of taking his life? Hanging. Hanging is nothing but torture. Hanging is nothing but torture. And therefore, that's why I, I in fact, had an occasion to give a, a memorial lecture some, uh, about three months ago, sometime in March, I'm sorry, March last year, uh, to a radical humanist group, which they invited me to give a memorial lecture. And I, this, I said the same thing. I said, type Supreme Court even now can strike down the death penalty because we have no other method of executing death sentence. The only method that we have is hanging, which is torture. And you commit torture till he takes the last breath. And that is ultra void the constitution and the government cannot do it. This is unfortunate thing. Our people must understand, the court must understand, judges must understand. I don't know whether, in my, not in my life, I hope you people can take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Suresh. He really raised an extremely important question about really who's qualified to impose death sentence. He felt that he as a judge wasn't because he felt he didn't know anything about the criminal, the person who was standing before him to whom he's imposing death. I just hope all our judges would feel that because then in practice we wouldn't have that sentence. And 